Hello everybody, this is Professor James Ormord, and today we're going to talk about colligative properties, uh, specifically the freedom point depression experiment. Uh, you, you are responsible for knowing a handful of colligative properties. Remember that colligative properties are things that uh, depend on the amount of solute particles uh, ratio compared to the amount of solvent particles. Uh, typically, concentrations in chemistry are measured in things such as, you know, molarity, but it turns out in this particular chapter that it is, it is useful to express units in terms of molality, which is moles of solute per kilogram of solvent. Uh, keep that in mind. That's a common trick question I see in these textbooks. They try to get you with the mass number. Uh, make sure that you, the mass number you put in is kilograms of solvent, not solution. But we typically use for molarity for comparison, it is moles of solute per liters of solution. The main reason why it is more useful to express units of concentration in terms of molality for colligative properties is because uh, the temperature, sorry, the molality value is independent of the temperature, uh, where molarity might actually change with temperature because volumes may expand or sh shrink as their volumes change. So to make sure that we're not worrying about any kind of uh, complications like that, we just work in molality and it works simple enough. Uh, you should have learned a handful of colligative properties in your lectures. Uh, these are including osmotic pressure, uh, Henry's law, uh, Rouse's law, boiling point elevation, and freezing point depression. All of these are dependent on the amount of solute particles per sol solvent particles. Uh, the short version for each of these, because we're going to be focusing on freezing point depression, but I just wanted to mention the other ones. Uh, Osmotic pressure is the amount of pressure required to prevent flow of solvent molecules across a semi-permeable membrane. Uh, so imagine we here that we have uh, two chambers separated by a semi-permeable membrane, meaning that the solvent mo molecules can pass across, but the solute uh, molecules cannot. So if, if we have one side that's, say, high in concentration of, say, salt, uh, NaCl and one is low concentration, uh, there'll be a tendency for uh, the water to flow towards the more concentrated side, therefore diluting both sides effectively. So what osmotic pressure is, is the amount of force required to stop that motion. Uh, in lecture, you, uh, you have learned an equation here. I did want to give you a tip that uh, this is basically a modified version of the ideal gas law, PV equals NRT. So all you have to do here is you substitute in osmotic pressure for P, and then uh, solve, uh, remove the V to the other side, and then you end up with N over V on that side. And then you have the textbook equation now, which is uh, pi is equal to MRT, which is molarity, essentially N over V. So uh, you've already uh, learned this equation before. Just think about it in that terms in, uh, in, in studying the solving the problems. You've done this math before. Henry's law is discussing uh, gas solubility as, as a function of temperature. Uh, the short version of this is that uh, as uh, liquids cool down, uh, gas solubility increases, uh, which is typically the opposite of most liquids. Uh, we've seen previously in this course, as you raise the temperature of, of solutions, typically solubility increases. Uh, but what works out for gases, the opposite is true. Uh, the remaining three colligative properties that I want to mention here uh, kind of all feed into each other. They're all interrelated, and I want to just go ahead and discuss it here. So the first one here I want to mention is Raoult's law, which is vapor pressure lowering. Uh, what this implies is that as you add uh, impurities, you know, sol solutes into a solvent, essentially what happens is the vapor pressure lowers. And if you think about it in terms of their boiling point, what is happening there is uh, remember that the definition of a boiling point is when the vapor pressure is equal to the atmospheric pressure. So if you're uh, lowering the vapor pressure of that solution, you're effectively raising the boiling point. Uh, the big thing I want you guys to remember here is that essentially if you have uh, the more impurity you have into the pure substance, the broader the range is that it'll maintain a, a, or it'll be a liquid. So the boiling point goes up, and we see that the, on the other end of the spectrum, the melting point goes down. And we're going to explore that numerically in today's experiment. During this discussion, you guys should have seen a lot of equations in your lecture, uh, but I want to focus on the one that is important for today's lab. Uh, that is the freezing point depression equation. So this equ uh, equation is defined. I'll put it right here, down below. <laughs> it is uh, delta Tf. The change in the freezing point is equal to final minus initial. That's typically how we measure change. And it works out where you say it's uh, the freezing point of the solution minus the freezing point of the solvent. And that works out to be negative IKF times M. So that's the, I is the Van't Hoff factor. 
Uh, that's how many effective particles are in a solution. Uh, so for this case, in today's experiment, we are dissolving naphthalene into cyclohexane. Uh, naphthalene should not disassociate, so the Van Hoff factor is 1. Uh, in the case where it would dissociate, say we're looking at, you know, water, putting salt into it, NaCl, that would break apart into ions, the Van Hoff factor there would be 2. Uh, this can be uh, kind of muddled a little bit depending on the solubility of things that dissociate, but the main thing I want you guys to remember for today's experiment is the Van Hoff factor is 1. Uh, we have the Kf value, which is the one we're solving for today. Uh, this is the cryoscopic constant, or more simply called the freedom point depression constant. Uh, this is depending on what solvent you're actually using. We're going to have a unique one here today uh, for cyclohexane after the experiment. And then the last factor, which is very important, is the molality. That's telling you how many solute particles you have per solvent which remember is moles of solute over kilograms of solvent. So in today's lab, the moles is going to be naphthalene, and then the kilograms of solvent should be the cyclohexane. I also want to point out the factor of the negative factor in the equation here. This is uh, just dealing with the value of the sign. When you calculate your delta T, it's going to be negative here, and we want to get a positive value. So this is corrected for by this negative sign. You can also use that to help you remember which one is which, right? So which, if it's negative, it is the free the point depression constant equation. If it's positive, it's the boiling point elevation equation. So we're going to be running a, a series of experiments here. Uh, first, we're going to get the uh, free the point of pure cyclohexane at the point of comparison. And then we're also going to get the uh, free the point of two different uh, naphthalene slash cyclohexane solutions. And then uh, from these values, after we have the freedom point of both the pure solvent and the mixture, you can calculate delta T. And then from there, you can just uh, take your equation down below once again, and then just take your delta T. It looks like we'll just divide by molality here uh, to get our KF value. So I think we know enough now to get started. Uh, make sure that you practice these calculations and let's go ahead and turn it over to uh, Professor Craig Knapp. What are we doing here? So you need to prepare the ice bath. And so this is RO water. Uh, that's what we have in the lab. And you need to add a good solid dollop of salt. Don't be bashful. Give it a nice mix uh, in here. This will get a nice low temperature. This will bring the temperature down to about minus 10 degrees Celsius. So it'll freeze nice and fast uh, for the naphthalene. Since the naphthalene has a melting point of about 6 Celsius, it will freeze even with regular salt. But there we go. That'll work. Let me rinse this off. So it doesn't start rusting. Okay. And you can put this here. And then uh, let's weigh out the naphthalene and the cyclohexane. So here's the setup. Uh, we need about 20 milliliters of cyclohexane. This, this is a good way to measure it. Uh, it doesn't have to be exactly 20 mils, but I'll just pour it in here. In the vicinity. Uh, what matters is the mass. So we'll be doing a second batch coming up. And what I do need to do is get the uh, cyclohexane in here. So this is set at zero, to, uh, zero for the grams at the moment. So I've got this unit in here, and I'm going to press the essentially the tear button. There we go. So it drops that to zero for uh, the mass, and then we'll pour in. the cyclohexane, about 20 mils, and then take the mass on it. So you can calculate the molality of the solution. So everyone see that number there? All right. And I'll take that out. And what I need to do now is measure the mass of the naphthalene. So we'll I'll put in between 0.15 and 0.2 grams. Let's see if this works okay. Or if it, I'm going to give an error message. Oh, good. So I've got the weighing boat in here. Here's the naphthalene. 
this is the smallest of the uh, of the, uh, the dimethyl chicken wire compounds and we need to put in between 0.15 and 0.2 grams so we don't need to put this in yet because uh, we're going to take the freezing point of the pure cyclohexane first but I'm going to take this over and have it ready so take the measurement there excellent let me get a good look at the solid too oh yes you bet I'll just set it here the white crystalline solid so this mass of cyclohexane we're going to be used twice. We're going to freeze it once as a pure material, and then we'll add the naphthalene to it and freeze it a second time, and the freezing point will be depressed. It will be lower than the first time. Okay. And then we'll have to repeat it for the second round. The cyclohexane. <laughs> okay, we're ready to uh, freeze the pure cyclohexane. And here's the uh, computer all set up. It's connected to our thermometer here. And I'll put this in. Bring it into equilibrium. There we go. So you can see the temperature here. And what I will do then is go ahead, plunge this in, and start the computer at the same time. Like that. There we go. And I'll just keep stirring this guy. And you can see the temperature drop as the uh, cyclohexane gets cold. At some point, when it reaches the freezing point, the uh, energy that's being removed from the cyclohexane will not go to a temperature drop. That's why it's called the latent heat of fusion. Uh, so as the cyclohexane freezes, uh, the energy will go into creating the solid from the liquid. Then after it, you can see the temperature dropping here, then after the cyclohexane freezes, the temperature will start to go down again. The same thing happens with any solid liquid uh, change in uh, state. So temperatures uh, will continue to drop until it starts to freeze. And we can see our temperature here. Now, even if we don't have the um, freezing point of the cyclohexane compared to the literature value, what matters is not the absolute temperature, but the difference in temperature between the pure solvent and the solvent with the naphthalene in it. And so your delta T is what matters. And so even if this temperature is off a little bit, don't worry about it. It's going to be pretty close to the true uh, to the uh, freezing point in the literature here. I see. So you can see we're starting to level out here. So the cyclohexane is freezing. In fact, oh yes, you can. it's it's definitely cloudy. <laughs> I'm sorry, <laughs> but I just wanted to show you that it is in fact freezing. And, it, it, didn't uh, show in, it didn't show in the data when you took it out, so. <laughs> it didn't show in the data, that's right. So the colligative property, it matters how many particles there are in solution. We use this, cyclohexane has a nice freezing point compared to that of water. And naphthalene behaves like a normal uh, uh, solvent, or I'm sorry, solute. It behaves like a normal solute. And it gives good numbers. Not everything behaves normally, unfortunately. Oh, yeah, look at that. It's really flat. Uh, this, this is a good, good value here. Let's see. We're supposed to go to three minutes. Where are we at here? Oh, we're uh, uh, 30 seconds away. Yeah, you can see it's going to be 6.1. But, but we'll do a, a graph on it, do a linear fit. 78, 79, 180 seconds. Good. So we'll stop the button here. And it still has a little bit of liquid in here, but it's definitely mostly solid. Okay, I'll set that out of the way. Hang on. Can I go ahead and do the analyze and fit here? Yep, I just want to make it that I can see. And uh, linear fit right here. And here we go. We've got a temperature of 6. Point, oh well, can you see it? 
Yeah, I might want to just say it too, just to make sure. Okay. So what is it, 6.1 of the thing? 2.1, 6.21. All right. So that's uh, the average value over that range where it's freezing. So the next thing, we weighed out our first sample of naphthalene. Here is the cyclohexane, uh, which has been warmed up. By the way, uh, I normally have students warm it up under the tap uh, because it melts quickly. So I will put in the cyclohexane, or I'm sorry, put the naphthalene in the cyclohexane. Here's a vortex mixer. Everything has to be dissolved. I like vortex mixers. They're a lot of fun to play with. They're entertaining to watch. <laughs> that looks really cool. Sure beats a stirring rod. Boy, I'll say. Uh -huh. Let me check. Have to check carefully to make sure there's no naphthalene. Oh, there's a couple particles in there. Let me continue uh, running. Okay. Oh yes, this is all dissolved. All right. No particles whatsoever in it. And these these crystals are pretty close in in uh, density to the sol solvent, so they're hard to see. Okay. Same thing as before then. Uh, we'll put in the thermometer. Thank you. Let it equilibrate a little bit. There we go. So back up to room temperature. Looking good. So I will go ahead and uh, where is my cursor guy? I'm ready to collect the data. All I have to do is put this in and start the data collection and run it for three minutes. So you should see the same thing as before. That is, the temperature will drop, but it won't be a nice sharp line where it levels out. Instead, it's smushy. Uh, in fact, uh, for those of you that take organic chemistry, you'll take advantage of that fact because you'll take the melting point of materials that you prepare. And if it has a nice sharp melting range of one or two degrees, that means it's pure. But if it melts over five or ten degrees, that means it's impure. So uh, we see the same effect here. You can see it's starting to curve over. We'll let it go a full three minutes because uh, for this I need to do two, two fits uh, for the... Uh, cooling part and for the part where it levels out. But the temperature will still be dropping a little bit. It doesn't go completely level. Because it looks like it's getting mostly frozen here. Yeah. Well, it's it's bouncing around a little bit. Okay. This this actually, I'm going to stop stop the data collection here. Uh, because this is part of the curve that we want, not, not this uh, junkier stuff. Let me, uh... Then we need to select this area where it's going down, but before it starts to uh, come out a little bit. So this part of the curve is what I want. And then analyze linear fit to that. And then for the part of the curve where it's curved around and, and very slowly sinking. Uh, looks like about from here over to about here. And then same thing. Uh, I can find the cursor again. Analyze. Linear fit. And I've got, got the two curves here. You can see where uh, they cross and that will be the official freezing point for the mixture. So I want the interpolate for that and uh, just run it along here until I have the cursor uh, be, uh, where the lines cross. Ooh. Um. <clears throat> there, that's it looks good. What so this, the temperature is at the top here. Uh, uh, can you see it? What do they say? Just read it out. Um, it's uh, about, oh, let's see, the two are slightly off from each other. Let's see if I can get them exactly the same. It's really close. Come on. 
because I've got the two lines. Yeah, it's real close to 4.6 degrees. Uh, so I'm just going to have to pick it here. Uh, okay, 4. Point Uh, 4.57 and 4.56. So <laughs> that's at 4.57 degrees. All right. So there's the freezing point of the mixture for the first uh, solution. So what we do now is do it again. Okay. We've already done the freezing point of the pure material. We don't need to do that again. So okay. what we're doing is preparing a second batch of the solution. So what I need to do is weigh out the new test tube and on this and uh, on this guy. Let's see. Bring that to zero. I need about 20 milliliters of the cyclohexane. Once again, the exact volume isn't critical because we, oops, we get it by mass. Sorry about that. Uh, that's good. It's, it's not quite 20, but it's close. So put this in here then. There we go. Very nice. And you can see the mass there. So that's the mass of the cyclohexane. The little icon that popped up right here. There you go. All right, now it's, I think it's done. All right. And I need a new bat, fresh batch of uh, methylene. So for this guy. Set everything to zero here. And as before, between 0.15 and 0 0.20 grams of methylene. They're missing out on all the smells. Oh, yes. <laughs> Napoline, you may know, is our mothballs. Oh, got it. It's between 0.5 and 1.5 and 2. So there's that mass. There you go. So if I could settle, right? Okay. Napoline does, is, does not absorb moisture from the air. So that's not a problem. Of course, over time, it does sublime. So it will slowly drop in, in uh, mass, slowly. All right, let's go back. So I have the pure naphthalene. I have the uh, uh, pure naphthalene and the pure cyclohexane. I will add this together, get that stuff in there, and we'll dissolve it like before. Don't worry about the ice, it's still in good condition here. Let me put the yeah, thermometer in here. Yeah. This will be at room temperature. I'm gonna back it up a little. Looking good. So I'm ready to do the plunge again. So I've got my finger on the button to collect the data. Yeah, put this in and we'll do our three minutes of uh, data collection. The other nice thing about the cyclohexane naphthalene setup is that the, uh, the uh, freezing point depression constant is quite large. So you get good delta T values even when your molality concentration is low. It's not quite to 180, but this, this is absolutely linear. I'm going to stop it. We, we will get good numbers with this. Okay, let me go ahead, move this out of the way, and then we need to do our two linear fits again. So I will pick it up right here where it's dropping in temperature. Yeah, that looks good. To about, oh, maybe not even here. That looks good. And then uh, analyze, linear fit. And over here, 
do the same thing. I'll select a range and uh, analyze. Linear fit. And then we've got our place where the two lines cross. That will be the official freezing point. Yes, there we go. So 4.86 degrees. Both of them say 4.86. All right, looks like we're all done. That's it.